Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get us started since I happen to know that um, our speaker will be going a little long. <laughs> so uh, welcome everybody to um, the targeted neonatal echocardiography. Um, neonatologists performed echocardiography foundations curriculum series. We are getting close to wrapping up this year's uh, uh, talks, and we hope that you have enjoyed them. Um, we uh, do want to let you know that we uh, change um, our, you know, program formatting, and we uh, take all of your suggestions from the evaluation uh, into consideration when planning for the following year. So I will put this up again at the end um, of the uh of the lecture, but um, you can also take the QR code now to fill out uh, the evaluations for us. Um, quick uh, housekeeping things, please put any questions that you might have into the Q&A box and we will try to get to those as much as we can at the end of the lecture. Those of you that are panelists, our hemodynamics trainees and junior faculty, feel free to um, to unmute yourself and ask your questions and or turn on your camera if you'd like to ask questions. You do, you're not uh, required to do that to ask a question, but we do want to have as much interaction as possible. Um, we will be recording the lecture part of portion of this. The Q&A afterwards will not be recorded um, and that those are then uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, so without further ado, um, I know our speaker does not require an introduction whatsoever, but I'm still going to do it. So uh, Dr. Danny Wise, who is my co-chair uh, currently for the Foundations Curriculum Series, is a neonatal intensivist and co-director of the Pediatric Cardiology and Neonatal Hemodynamics and Targeted Neonatal Echocardiography Program at Sunnybrook uh, Health Sciences Center in Toronto, Canada. Dr. Wise's specific research interests include the epidemiology and management of patent ductus arteriosus, transitional hemodynamics and its association with early neonatal morbidity and non-invasive cardiac output monitoring in extremely preterm infants. For today's uh, curriculum series uh, talk, he's going to be talking about controversies, controversies in the hemodynamic management of extremely preterm neonates during transition. And with that, one more quick reminder to put any questions into the Q&A box um, if you are not a panelist, and I will hand it over to Dr. Wise. Thank you very much, uh, Danielle. I'll just uh, try and share my screen. Okay. Um, thumbs up if you can see the right set of slides. Looks like yeah, it's okay. we can see them. Okay, so thanks so much for the opportunity to present today. Um, it's like singing a song at your own wedding, I guess, because kind of, I'm one of the chairs. But it's a pleasure to present today on a, obviously, a really interesting topic. This feels like kind of three lectures in one, because there's so much to neonatal transition. Um, and what I want to take you through are some of the transitional pitfalls for preterm neonates, which are intricately related to hemodynamics. And it goes in this uh, schemata of uh, hours after birth from time zero to, to 72 hours after birth. There are a lot of pitfalls and speed bumps that extremely preterm neonates or any neonates, in fact, sometimes have to deal with. And it starts with delivery room management. And certainly in the first 12 hours or so, there's a very high rate of hypoxemic respiratory failure and need for surfactant. Uh, starting within an hour or two after birth until about 24 hours, there's a controversial topic of hypotension, low systemic blood pressure, and how to manage that. And then a bit further along, starting at between about 24 and 72 hours, there's a period of time where most babies who are going to have intraventricular hemorrhage have, have it during this time period. Uh, and the same is with pulmonary hemorrhage, though there are some, of course, that occur a little bit earlier and later than that. Um, and no talk about transition uh, is complete without a very brief review of the uh, transitional circulation and that there are three key hemodynamic changes that occur in a neonate after they're born. The first occurs with clamping of the umbilical cord, and that results in an increase and a substantial increase at that in systemic vascular resistance as you get rid of the low 
uh, resistance placental circuit. Uh, ventilation and air uh, results in a dramatic and abrupt decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance, which increases pulmonary blood flow. And then the, com the combination of one and two uh, and the fact that the pulmonary and uh, systemic circulations now function in series rather than in parallel results in increase in left ventricular output and workload. Now that's quite complicated, but term babies make this transition seem easy. Why isn't it all roses for preterm babies? And how is the structure and function of the preterm heart possibly related and different than that of term babies? I know this has been discussed here before, so I'll be brief about it, but there are both structural and functional immaturities of the preterm heart. Structurally, um, there is a difference in the nucleation that the cardiac, the myocytes, uh, are predominantly uninucleate in the preterm baby and become increasingly binucleate over time, and that increases the capacity for protein synthesis and response to stress. Now, functionally, what certainly what really matters more is that there are significant functional differences between term and preterm babies. And this is a, uh, a look at the association of LVO versus preload and coronary blood flow versus preload, and there are differences between term babies who are the solid lines and on the left graph and preterm babies who are the interrupted lines that for given increases in preload, there are significantly higher increases in LV output and that's indexed to weight. In addition, as you can see on the right panel, that for the same increase in preload, preterm babies have a, a significantly increased um, percentage of coronary flow, indicating that the preterm myocardium has to work harder and needs more oxygen, needs more resources in order to manage that increase in preload. It's a similar story and perhaps even more important with afterload. And on the left panel is left ventricular output against afterload. And for term babies, they tolerate afterload fairly well. But as blood pressure or as blood pressure is the predominant contributor to afterload in the setting of normal anatomy, but as afterload increases, for the most part, LVO stays, this, stays fairly constant until afterload, until the afterload actually increases significantly. But you can see that amongst preterm neonates, there's a significant drop off in LV output uh, as afterload starts to increase. And similarly to preload in the right panel, as afterload increases, coronary blood flow increases certainly more in the preterm neonates as they have uh, increased myocardial work and less efficiency. So let's tackle our first case, and, and that has to do with hypoxemic respiratory failure despite surfactant treatment. So this was a baby who was born at 25 and five weeks with a birth weight of 745 grams, born after an uncomplicated pregnancy until the onset of preterm labor. This baby was delivered by cesarean section due to breech presentation and the resuscitation involved delayed core clamping for, for excuse me, 60 seconds, followed by which the baby was stabilized on nasal CPAP. Baby unfortunately was intubated at 15 minutes because was in 100% oxygen and was placed on first intention HFO, which is a standard here at Sunnybrook in Toronto. And we used a mean air pressure of 10 centimeters of water, a targeted tidal volume of 1.5 mils per kilo and frequency of 10. A baby was using about 15 to 20 centimeters of water for the amplitude. Now, post surfactant, the baby was still in 80% oxygen and had about a 10% pre and post ductal saturation differences. However, the heart rate was normal at 165 and baby's blood pressure was 45 over 30. An arterial blood gas done from the umbilical arterial catheter showed a pH of 7.33, PaCO2 of 48, a PaO2 of 45, a bicarb of 23, and a deficit of minus 1 with a lactate of 1.5. Now, I know this is core neonatology, but there's a bit of a recipe approach to the management of post surfactant severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, and that these are the five things that we all do in our day to day work. The first is to intubate and ventilate, to rule out re reversible causes such as pneumothorax or pleural effusion, to target optimal lung volumes, uh, particularly targeting lung volumes at functional residual capacity where PVR is minimized, uh, sedation and muscle relaxation, and also targeting a PaCO2 in the uh, normal or slightly hypercapnic range. Uh, and as you can see there that, uh, the, that in that range, it's a safe area where PVR is minimized without negatively impacting cerebral blood flow. So because the baby, because we had done all those five things and we were ventilating well, and baby was uh, well inflated, but not overinflated, uh, but still severely hypoxemic, 
um, we went ahead and did a echocardiogram and that uh, these clips should be working, but they seem to be paused, but I'll describe them anyway. On the top left is a parasternal long axis view um, looking at um, the showing a severely dilated right ventricle with systolic dysfunction. Uh, I apologize, there's a, doesn't seem to be working so well at the moment. Uh, the bottom left is a RV three chamber view, which show that the uh, RV systolic function was impaired with a fractional area change of 19%. The top right panel uh, shows a, a, P, a pulse wave Doppler in the PDA, showing predominantly a right to left shunt. And the bottom right panel uh, was a three-legged stool view showing completely right to left flow across the ductus. The other relevant indices was that the TAPSI was two millimeters. Uh, the RVO was low at 50 mils per kilo per minute. LV performance was normal with an ejection fraction of 56%. Left ventricular output was mildly decreased at 120 mils per kilo per minute. And with the shunts, there was a right to left shunt at the atrial level, but otherwise normal enough. So the first poll question for everyone is, what should be the next step in management of this baby? Is it nitric INO at 20 parts per million, epinephrine 0.03 mics per kilo per minute, norinone 0.33, or vasopressin at 0.3 milliunits per kilo. Okay, looking like over half of us thought of INO, and uh, that is probably where I would have gone, but you're clashing, unfortunately, against some very important policymakers. And in 2014, the AAP put out a statement, and the top right, as you can see, says guidance for the clinician in rendering pediatric care, where they said that neither rescue nor routine use of INO improves survival in preterm infants with respiratory failure, and that the preponderance of evidence does not support treating preterm infants who have respiratory failure with INO. These were both given strong recommendations. Um, and as neonatologists are dutifully follow all of the clinical guidelines put out by our governing bodies, um, this, is, this is where they came out in, in 2014. Uh, now, there's certainly a spectrum of the quality and, um, and veracity of advice given. And in terms of the spectrum to the left of your screen are policies that have come up saying, you know, I know may be dangerous, do not use because it causes intraventricular hemorrhage. On the other hand, are some policies which we'll look at in a minute showing that I know is probably safe and effective and can be considered for use. Uh, and in addition to the 2014 policy, the NICHD put out a statement in 2011 stating that evidence does not support use of INO for early rescue in the care of preterm infants, which is the case that I just presented. Though they did add a caveat that in rare clinical situations, including pulmonary hypertension, uh, INO may have a benefit. Well, how did neonatologists around the world respond to the publication of these statements? Well, although uh, they showed the data from the USA, the NICHD and NRN network show that actually INO utilization increased after the NICHD statement in 2011. Uh, and similarly in, in England, um, both after the NICHD statement and um, the AAP statement in 2014, INI utilization actually increased further, that there was an acceleration in the use of nitric oxide uh, amongst neonatologists in England. And uh, in this graph, the gray bar uh, the grade line indicates those um, the INO use amongst babies under 29 weeks. So the left graph shows that INO utilization dramatically increased in the population of babies under born at less than 29 weeks. And concomitantly, there was a decrease in death amongst the neonates treated with INO. Um, and the combination of the two either suggests that INO really made a difference in survival or that clinicians were actually using it more liberally, perhaps in babies who are, whose oxygen index was not as severe uh, and, and so kind of going against the published recommendations of the day. Now, subsequent to that, there of course have been a number of other uh, policy statements put out that have been a bit more favorable toward the use of INO in preterm babies. I'll highlight in 2015, the AHA and in 2016, the PPHN net put out statements that INO can be beneficial for infants born preterm with severe PPHN physiology particularly if associated with prolonged rupture of membranes and both hydramnios. The Cochrane Review in 2017 was a bit more lukewarm, and the Canadian Pediatric Society statement in 2023 
um, was on the bit more favorable side as long as you had echo confirmation of pulmonary hypertension. I want to highlight this particular editorial uh, and workshop summary put out by Satyan Lakshman Rasimha a few years ago, where he penned a really, really nice title, kind of almost as a rebuttal to some of the statements going against INO use in preterm infants. And the title was, Just Say No to INO in Preterms, Really? Almost akin to kind of the 1980s, Just Say No to Drugs uh, ads um, that circulated in the, in the Reagan and post-Reagan era in, in America. And what him and his group uh, wrote about was that although INO has been suggested not to be used by several policy organizations, um, that in fact, no RCT has been performed in newborns born preterm with inclusion criteria of documented PPHN physiology. And that all of the data comes from RCTs that study nitric oxide for the prevention of PPD, so an entirely different population. Um, so the question is really, what did those policymakers have against the use of INO? Was it that INO simply didn't work, that there was no response to hypoxemia to improve hypoxemia in preterm neonates? Or was it that we don't know who to treat with? We don't know who's actually going to have a good response? Or was it that some babies might respond, some preterm babies, but those who do respond really derive no benefit with respect to improvement in outcomes? Well, let's tackle these questions. Uh, the first is that, um, does INO improve severe hypoxemia among preterm neonates? And this is data from the University of Iowa showing the response rate for INO amongst preterm neonates by gestational age. And the responders are those indicated with these dark uh, spotted parts of the bar. And overall, the response rate was about 74% in this retrospective cohort where the mean gestation was 24 weeks. And they were treated with nitric oxide within 96 hours after birth. There's data from colleague Michelle Baczynski, who's a RT at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, who similarly found a 65% positive response rate in a very large prospective cohort of extremely preterm neonates treated with INO within 72 hours after birth. So INO does seem to improve hypoxemia, but can we use, is there a way to predict which babies are going to respond to INO? The answer is yes. The answer is actually echocardiography estimates of pulmonary hypertension, that when babies have an echo, Prior to starting nitric oxide, the finding of pulmonary hypertension on the echo identifies babies who are eight times more likely to have a positive response to nitric oxide compared with those who do not have pulmonary hypertension on the echo. And finally, is responsiveness to INO associated with improved outcomes among preterm units? Here, the answer is a resounding yes. In this, in this systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, Michelle identified that preterm babies who responded to INO at 75% lower mortality compared to non-responders. Um, so overall, there's a set of data, while not an RCT, it does show that A, INO improves hypoxemia amongst preterm babies, that we can predict which preterm babies with pulmonary hypertension or with HRF are going to respond to nitric oxide, and that amongst those who respond, there is a significantly, there's a significant reduction in mortality. And this well, this is not RCT evidence and certainly doesn't necessarily state what would happen if you didn't treat with nitric oxide. Uh, it provides a rationalization of preterm nitric oxide treatment, assuming you've already done those initial steps uh, to prep a baby and ensure that they have no other mitigating factors. So the case resolution for this baby was we started nitric oxide at 20 parts per million. The baby weaned to 21% oxygen within four hours. Uh, the RV started to improve on its own, but baby developed systemic hypotension and so was supported with uh, vasopressin and subsequently had an uncomplicated NICU course and went home. So we've looked at, in very briefly, of course, the HRF that is really common in preterm babies, and especially if they have it post-surfactant. And often babies, even if they don't have hypoxemic respiratory failure, uh, um, and if they do and they get surfactant, many of them come down to a low amount of oxygen, but a large percentage of them, at least uh, 15 to 30 percent, experience hypotension in this transitional period. And it's an area of controversy. So this is the second case, and that case is a different baby. It's a 24-weeker who, after spontaneous onset of labor and a vaginal delivery, was intubated at five minutes, received surfactant, and was ventilated on first intention high-frequency jet ventilation 
with a PIP of 20, a PEEP of 7, a rate of 240, and an I-time of 0.02 and 21% oxygen. But at six hours of age, uh, our team was called by the bedside nurse because the blood pressure had drifted down and was now reading 32 over 15 with a mean of 21. On clinical exam, the JV was active with handling, was well perfused, uh, had a cap refill time of two seconds, normal pulses uh, with no murmur. Uh, the blood gas was reasonably reassuring, the pH of 7.28, CO2 of 56, bicarb of 20 and a deficit of minus five, the lactate was 1.9, and the hemoglobin was 160. This baby had received uh, delayed core clamping. So if you were in this situation, I'm pretty certain most people on uh, the call today have been in this situation, what would you do? Would you give a saline bolus, uh, start dopamine at five, dibutamine at five, apply cerebral nears to estimate uh, cerebral saturation, or repeat a gas and lactate in three hours? So most people are erring on the side of additional monitoring and evaluation. So if only a few people are jumping onto the treatment bandwagon, I think that's probably the, uh, the course du jour. But of course, if you're thinking of treating, you'd want to know why you're treating. So is hypotension in the transitional period associated with adverse outcomes? And the answer here is mixed. And, uh, on the left side, left panel are, are large it was a large prospective study looking at the association of hypotension with neurodevelopmental outcomes and found no association. Uh, regard, regardless of the index or severity of blood pressure, it was not associated with uh, Bailey scores at two years. But other studies as in the right panel do associate a low mean, mean arterial pressure in the first 24 hours incrementally and ordinarily with increases in the risk of IVH, BPD, and death. And then the question of should hypotension in the transitional period be treated with antihypotensive therapy? Again, there is uh, uh, data on both sides of the aisle here. On the left panel are a couple of large studies that have associated more harm than benefit with treatment and suggested not to treat low blood pressure. On the right panel are other studies that have suggested to treat, but there's a benefit compared with no treatment. And then other systematic reviews from colleagues in the UK that compared dopamine versus dibutamine, found that if you're going to treat, dopamine improves the number more so than dibutamine, but decreases cardiac output. And recently, there was a publication from Gene Dempsey and colleagues, the HIP trial, the hypotension and preterm neonates trial that randomized uh, hypotensive preterm babies to either dopamine or placebo. And amongst this group of babies, where the, and the trial was truncated because of difficulty in recruitment, uh, the babies were extremely preterm with mean gestation of 25 weeks. They were nearly all mechanically ventilated. They were all were hypotensive. And this happened fairly early, early on after birth. They had low lactates. But uh, overall, there was really no difference in the primary outcome of survival with severe ultrasound abnormality amongst either the dopamine or placebo group. So the take-home message early for uh, hypotension appears to be that it's uh, the existence of hypotension and its treatments during transition are variably associated with adverse outcomes. And while dopamine treatment improves the blood pressure, it doesn't improve outcomes among hypotensive neonates and may in fact decrease cardiac output. And of course, I know you're already all thinking, what are we actually treating? And this comic speaks to, uh, you know, here's to missing the big picture. And the idea here is that blood pressure is quite easy to measure because most many of times you have an indwelling arterial catheter, but it's probably not exactly what we need to know. And the causes and contri contributions, the causes of low blood pressure and the contributors to blood pressure are multifactorial. Mean arterial pressure is the product of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. And so changes in blood pressure, either high or low, um, can be representative of uh, impairments in preload, such as obstructive phenomenon, uh, hypovolemia, uh, impairment in contractility, such as with HIE, other forms of ischemia or cardiomyopathy, or a state of low systemic vascular resistance, such as a parallel circulation, PDA, for example, vasodilatory conditions, such as adrenal insufficiency, sepsis, or even autonomic dysfunction. So I'll put the question to you. In the case of our baby, uh, you know, a generally well 25-weeker 
in room air, although ventilated, what is the cause of low blood pressure on day one among generally well, extremely preterm neonates? Is it LV dysfunction, PDA, adrenal insufficiency, hypovolemia, or autonomic dysfunction? Okay, so there's some, definitely certainly some spread here um, with concern about LV dysfunction, PDA, adrenal insufficiency, and autonomic dysfunction, but no one really feeling that hypovolemia is a contributory cause. So let's look at some of the evidence. So this is data from, uh, from Toronto, from Jose Aldana, uh, who is a pediatric cardiologist and neonatologist, and uh, did a, co a retro retrospective cohort study including hypotensive neonates who had an echocardiogram prior to any intervention and matched them by gestational age and age at echo with normal tensive uh, babies who were part of a prospective cohort study uh, and so part of normative data. And what he identified was that hypotensive babies that were well, these were all babies with uh, in low oxygen, you know, under 30% oxygen, lactates were under uh, four, whose pHs were over 7.2, um, that their indices of LV systolic function were actually better than those babies who were normal tensive. And that was both res with respect to the fractional shortening and the mean velocity of circumferential fiber shortening. They had lower indices of LV afterload, specifically LV end systolic wall stress, so no difference in the stress velocity index. And also interestingly, they had uh, much larger PDA diameters and a greater frequency of having a PDA diameter of more than 1.5 millimeters. And the take home message from this study was that hypotension among stable extremely preterm neonates, so low FiO2 and normal lactate, may be related to either a large PDA or a state of low systemic vascular resistance. The study was not able to differentiate between the two, but most importantly, we thought it really wasn't, a, we didn't find any, any um, suggestion that LV systolic dysfunction was a pertinent reason here. Now, hypovolemia is definitely a cause of early hypotension, and the studies and meta-analyses of delayed core clamping show a causative relationship with hypovolemia. And it may be more of decreased circulating blood volume, but delayed core clamping does increase mean arterial blood pressure by about, on average, three millimeters of mercury in the early hours after birth. Um, the question, of course, is amongst babies who don't get delayed core clamping and are hypotensive, and maybe have a lower hemoglobin, should you give that baby a transfusion? That is, the answer to that question is not yet known. But moving to what we're really interested in is not actually the blood pressure, but it's what the blood pressure represents. And we're really looking for signs of circulatory failure. And this is a graph uh, of oxygen consumption or VO2 on the y-axis against DO2 on the x-axis, showing that when DO2 is plentiful, as toward the right of the graph, uh, VO2 is fairly constant. But as DO2 de uh, decreases, you reach an inflection point where you start to have flow-dependent oxygen consumption. And we're trying to use our hemodynamic knowledge and diagnostic tools to identify the babies that are on that, uh, that sharp plane, that sharp slope of the curve. And the importance here is that um, blood pressure is probably not the best measure of systemic blood flow. And this is data that you may have seen before. We're really showing that there's quite a poor correlation between either mean or systolic blood pressure and SBC flow, which is a, a, a reasonably validated measure of systemic blood flow. So blood pressure probably doesn't tell us what we're looking for. It doesn't really tell us about circulatory failure. So if we were to consider how good is blood pressure as a diagnostic test for systemic blood flow, you would create your two by two uh, table. And you would we would see that uh, for babies who have low blood pressure, um, low blood pressure identifies the babies outlined here in yellow. And th those are two types of babies. There are babies with low blood pressure, but normal systemic blood flow who may not need treatment. And also the babies with low systemic blood flow who need treatment. But what, and also these babies are easy to identify, but there are babies that just looking at low blood pressure, it misses some of the babies with the normal blood pressure who do have low systemic blood flow. And that's the, uh, the fallacy of relying solely on blood pressure to identify these babies. So overall, the take-home point here is that hypotension during preterm transition is easier to recognize 
because we have often an indwelling arterial catheter or a blood pressure cuff, but it doesn't reliably tell us about systemic blood flow. And among well babies, low blood pressure may be related to PDA, low systemic vascular resistance, and data from the HIP trial, which I didn't show here, does show that amongst these babies, that actually the blood pressure often improves spontaneously. And there's uncertainty whether treatment in this setting, whether for PDA or for improving vascular tone, uh, actually confers any benefit to uh, clinical outcomes. So if we're looking for a better method of diagnosing circulatory failure, I'm sure you would agree that there are a couple of axioms that must be fulfilled uh, in order for use in preterm babies. Axiom number one is that the method of diagnosis that we use should predict disease. Number two, that following diagnosis, treatment aimed at restoring adequate DO2 should reduce the likelihood of disease, that we need both. So the next question is, which of the following markers of low systemic blood flow is strongly associated with transitional morbidity, such as mortality and IVH, among preterm neonates? Is it low SVC flow, so under 45 to 55 mils per kilo per minute? Is it a capillary refill time of more than two seconds? Is it a lactate of more than 2.5? Or is it a, a, a NEARS estimated cerebral regional saturation of under 65%? Okay, so most of, most of us are uh, pretty happy that SPC flow is a reasonable marker as well as NEARS. Uh, no one buys the cap refill time of more than two seconds, which I think is appropriate. And lactate of 2.5, we'll look at some data on that. So thank you for that. Um, now, there has been many, many studies of SPC flow and one of uh, our trainees here, Nishkal Prasad, um, is just finishing up the systematic review and meta-analysis of all of these studies indicating that low SVC flow on day one is very strongly associated with an increased risk of severe IVH compared with babies who have normal SVC flow. So babies who had low SVC flow had five times the risk of severe IVH, um, and this maintained even with, in the context of meta-regression, looking at things like gestational age. So certainly SVC flow is very, very strongly associated. There are some clinical and lab markers that may also be helpful. So one of them is a cap refill time of at least four seconds. This had a very high specificity for low SVC flow. So when you see it, it's important and shouldn't be ignored. If it's not there, it's less helpful. And also a lactate of over 5.6 was at a very high sensitivity and specificity for the outcome of death, severe IVH or PVL. So um, what about treatment? Axiom number two, even though when SVC flow and uh, I'll show you some data on NEARS in a moment, it may accurately identify the babies at risk. Do we know how to treat them um, in order to make it better? And both in studies of both the prevention of low SVC flow, as you see here, as well as the treatment of low SVC flow, whether it be dobutamine versus dopamine, as I showed you in David Osborne's study from many years ago, or Maria Carmen Bravo's study of dobutamine versus placebo, the trials have unfortunately not shown that uh, intervention improves clinical outcomes. Though uh, Dr. Bravo's study did tend toward improvement in some uh, reduction, some morbidities like IVH, though mortality was increased in the dobutamine group. But none of these were statistically significant. The limitation here, of course, was that meant all these studies were uh, underpowered. So in terms of our axioms for, for a diagnostic tool to identify circulatory failure, we seem to have found a method of diagnosis but we're still not sure what treatment thresholds uh, to act on uh, and what agent to actually use. Um, and NEARS, as many, of, uh, many of, of us in the audience identified, is associated with adverse outcomes, both short-term and long-term. And this is data from uh, a prospective study which showed that low regional cerebral saturation is associated with impairment and that it's associated with impairment on a continuous level, that the greater the threshold, the greater the percentage of time below uh, cerebral saturation of 55% in the first 72 hours, each percentage point or each hour, in fact, was associated with an increased in neurodevelopmental impairment, um, as it was with IVH and mechanical ventilation. But many people's enthusiasm for the use of NEARS has been tempered a little bit by the publication of the really well done Safe Boost 3 study published uh, last about a year ago, which randomized uh, extremely preterm babies to either 
uh, cerebral oximetry or usual care. And most importantly, though, with a preset algorithm of how to manage babies who um, have demonstrated on their NEARS monitor low regional saturation and low regional cerebral saturation. Uh, and in a pilot study or the phase two study, they had shown that following an algorithm reduced the burden of cerebral hypoxia. So there was a lot of enthusiasm that if we could apply it more widely, that we would see uh, the fruits of the labor that reducing cerebral hypoxia, which the algorithm did, would also translate to improvement in outcomes. Unfortunately, that was not the case, that in this study, there was no difference in uh, the outcomes of death or severe brain injury in babies monitored with NEARS versus who were not. Now, is there a potential role for NEARS in the subpopulation of babies that we're just talking about today, babies who are hypotensive? And there's always there's certainly some evidence that it may be, but it's still kind of in the uh, not yet operational. So this is data from a follow-up of or secondary analysis of the HIP study, the HIP trial, looking at um, on the left panel the transfer function gain, which is basically a measure of autoregulation against the mean arterial blood pressure, and the babies were divided according to those who were alive with no IVH on day seven, depicted in green and those who were, had either died or had an IVH by day seven depicted in red. And what this graph identifies is that the babies where autoregulation was intact, uh, they were, they, it was that profile of babies that were alive with no IVH on day seven, the babies who were on the outskirts of the autoregulation spectrum, um, but that uh, just straight near, straight regional cerebral saturation depicted on, in the right panel, there was no relationship uh, between uh, babies who were alive without morbidity versus deceased with morbidity. And some other important information was that amongst babies who were treated with, who were hypotensive and treated with dopamine, the dopamine treatment worsened measures of autoregulation on an ordinal scale. That if you treat it with any amount of dopamine, your autoregulation um, function appeared to worsen and that continued to get worse as the dopamine dose was increased. So the take home message here for NEARS amongst hypotensive neonates is that NEARS measures of cerebral autoregulation auto may discriminate which hypotensive neonates are at risk for adverse outcome, but it's kind of, it's still very preliminary and no one's really sure how to operationalize it at the moment. And that dopamine does not improve regional cerebral saturation or measures of autoregulation amongst hypotensive neonates. And we're still lacking evidence for specific treatment thresholds and types of treatment. Um, so there's a, certainly a hodgepodge of information and no clear set guidelines on how to manage hypotension. But here at Sunnybrook, we put together an algorithm really just to standardize care, which we know uh, improves the quality of care. And the algorithm looks something like this. That if you have an LGAN with low blood pressure during the first 24 hours after birth, the first step is to do a clinical uh, and laboratory or imaging or NEARS evaluation for signs of low systemic blood flow. And that's either in box one, which are red flags, uh, or box two, which are evidence-based signs. The red flags are really experiential, uh, but if you're a baby who's in 40% or more oxygen post-surfactant, uh, most of those babies have something else going on related to that hypotension. Same with the babies with severe systemic hypotension, the blood pressure more than five millimeters of mercury below the third centile, or babies who have an abnormal clinical exam or abnormal lab values, such as worsening metabolic acidosis. These are obvious signs of shock. The evidence-based signs of low systemic blood flow, we've seen some of them here already, but a low SBC flow, so under 45 to 55 mils per kilo per minute, a cap refill time of more than four seconds, a lactate of more than five arising, or NEARS demonstrating low regional cerebral saturation of under 65%, or a more than 20% drop from baseline, or impaired autoregulation. Now, if you fall into one of these categories where you have signs of low, evidence of low systemic blood flow, there is unfortunately no specific recipe, but the guidance is to diagnose and treat underlying etiology. Uh, and the etiologies are certainly vast. Hypovolemia, certainly amongst the babies who did not receive or who received, sorry, immediate cord clamping uh, to consider pulmonary overdistension, uh, that there's certainly a risk of uh, hypotension associated with PPHN in which vasopressin may be beneficial if LV systolic performance is normal. Some babies have sepsis, 
uh, and they simply need systemic vasoconstriction with norepinephrine or vasopressin. And certainly many do have LV dysfunction. Um, and just, I do wanna specify that the babies that we showed in, uh, in the trial of hypotensive, excuse me, in the cohort study of hypotensive versus normotensive babies, those were all well babies. That there are many babies that have uh, clinical concern for uh, systemic blood flow, and many of them do in fact have early LV dysfunction and low cardiac output, and they need an inotrope or uh, sometimes an inode dilator if they're hypotensive. Now for the babies who have, who do not have evidence of low systemic blood flow, do they meet criteria for conservative management? And that criteria is really looking at, are you a well baby? If they have an absence of severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, if they have a gradual and not sudden reduction in systemic blood pressure, and if there's serial clinical and laboratory examinations are reassuring. If not, then additional diagnosis and diagnostic measures should be undertaken. But if yes, then the management uh, could be to either uh, undertake conservative management with serial lab uh, and, or, or uh, echo imaging, or to do echocardiography targeted at PDA. And the evidence and practice for conservative management is that LGANs with low blood pressure and a reassuring exam may have either a PDA or state of low vascular tone, and their BP actually often spontaneously improves. Uh, the uncertainty about how to manage these well babies is unknown because we don't know whether PDA treatment in this scenario actually affects clinical outcomes. And we did see that in the HIP trial that treatment with dopamine does not actually improve clinical outcomes, and there's insufficient evidence to recommend other inotropes or vasopressors. So the take-home points rounding out hypotension is that hypotension on day one is variably associated with adverse outcomes, that empiric dopamine is not the drug to treat it, that etiology amongst well babies who have uh, you know, no lactic acidosis and are low oxygen, maybe either a PDA shunt or a period of uncompensated low afterload, and that early hypotension in an extremely preterm neonate who has normal clinical, biochemical, and years indices of end organ perfusion can probably man be managed with watchful waiting. And on the right, I included the data from the HIP trial showing spontaneous improvement in blood pressure even amongst the babies in the placebo group. Secondly, Inadequate systemic blood flow should probably not be managed conservatively, but we struggle to find easy, reliable clinical and lab measures of systemic blood flow. And trials of treatment or prevention have not shown uh, any benefit, though underpowered. And NEARS may be helpful, but we need additional evidence to operationalize it in practice for this specific subpopulation. And finally, this is a generic statement, but treatment of low systemic blood flow is highly varied and should probably be tailored to the underlying etiology. So moving along in our transitional, uh, in our schematic of morbidity ar arriving is a third case, and that's a baby who had a big bleed. And apologies again that uh, if the echo clip here doesn't work, but it was a 25-weeker who was born after preterm labor, who was stabilized on nasal CPAP in the delivery room and admitted to the NICU on a PEEP of eight in 25% oxygen. This baby at 12 hours after birth had multiple apneas and oxygen requirements increased to 40%. The baby was intubated and surfactant administered at this time. The echo at 30 hours identified a two millimeter PDA with unrestricted left to right shunt. And unfortunately at 36 hours, the baby developed profound pulmonary hemorrhage and unfortunately ultimately died. And so both IVH and pulmonary hem hemorrhage do happen to coincide occurring around the same time after birth. And if you've ever wondered why does it happen at this time and could it be preventable? Hopefully we'll, we'll look at that in the next uh, 10 minutes. But the first question I wanna ask you is, which of the following neonatal interventions has the strongest clinical evidence for the prevention of pulmonary hemorrhage amongst preterm neonates? Is it restricting the TFI over the first three days? Is it targeted uh, echo-guided early NSAID treatment for PDA? Is it prophylactic low-dose hydrocortisone or prophylactic indomethacin. Okay, so there's a lot of love here for targeted early NSAID treatment of PDA. Uh, the interesting question is how many of us practice it and what's the evidence for that and we'll take a look. I want to show you over the next few minutes 
is how pulmonary hemorrhage and intraventricular hemorrhage can probably be considered diseases of disordered transitional circulation and disordered physiology in preterm infants. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost, that those two are linked. We know from the timeline that they occur around the same time, and there's epidemiological evidence that they indeed co-occur in preterm babies. This is a data from a retrospective cohort study um, th which found that babies who had pulmonary hemorrhage were more than double or even triple likely to have a grade three or four IVH. And pulmonary hemorrhage is both common and deadly, especially for extremely preterm babies and microprems. On the left of the screen is the uh, percentage of, excuse me, the incidence per 1,000 admissions by gestational age. And almost 10% of babies born at 23 and 24 weeks end up having a pulmonary hemorrhage. And amongst babies with pulmonary hemorrhage, there is reduced survival. So on the right is a Captain Meyer curve comparing survival amongst babies who didn't have a pulmonary hemorrhage, which are the solid line at the top, and the babies who had pulmonary hemorrhage, which is the interrupted line, showing that the survival is about 20 to 30% lower amongst the babies who have uh, a pulmonary hemorrhage. So what are the physiological antecedents of acute pulmonary hemorrhage? And hemodynamically, is it something that we can predict? And the answer is yes. In the left panel is uh, a comparison of uh, babies who underwent prospective, in a prospective cohort study, serial echocardiograms, where an early echocardiogram uh, was done, and then babies were classified as to whether they went on to develop a pulmonary hemorrhage or no pulmonary hemorrhage. And they found that in the early echo, the babies who had an increase in pulmonary blood flow were more likely to go on to have a pulmonary hemorrhage. The panel on the right shows that ductal diameter appears to be related to those babies who go on to have a pulmonary hemorrhage. This is, again, all of these babies had echoes before their pulmonary, their, uh, the timing of pulmonary hemorrhage. And the babies who did not have a, um, a pulmonary hemorrhage are indicated as the dark triangles. The babies who did have a pulmonary hemorrhage are indicated by the gray, dark gray circles. And almost all the babies that had a pulmonary hemorrhage had a PD diameter of at least 1.6 millimeters um, on their early echo. And that's one of the reasons where that threshold of 1.6 millimeters uh, for early PDA evaluation has come from. So this data alone, when you take it in isolation, suggests that uh, you may have a, a PDA, an associated increase in pulmonary blood flow, and as a result, there's uh, hemorrhage in the lungs. But the PDA, of course, is only one piece of the puzzle, and that's because Physiologically, anyone who does echo knows that it's very uncommon for the ductal shunt to be at its largest in the first few days after birth. So why, does, why do most pulmonary hemorrhages happen during this time? And the, and the graph here shows the timing of pulmonary hemorrhage amongst the cohort of babies that had a pulmonary hemorrhage. And you can see that between 24 and, and 96 hours, most of the babies that had a pulmonary hemorrhage ha happens during that time period. And the data, uh, uh, the clues to the data comes from lab-based uh, animal data from many years ago, which showed that um, the problem is not actually necessarily one of pulmonary blood flow, but really one of pulmonary venous hypertension. And this is data in preterm lambs, uh, where uh, you know, one specific aspect of their hemodynamics was altered at a time. And these, this group found that by increasing pulmonary blood flow, there was really no increase in capillary pressure. These are, this is pulmonary capillary pressure. When they went back and went put the pulmonary blood flow back to normal, uh, but went ahead and increased left atrial pressure, this resulted in a significant increase in uh, capillary pressure. And the take home message here was that in preterm infants, it's stress, the stress failure of the pulmonary capillaries that results in hemorrhage occurs when there's marked elevation of capillary pressures resulting from increased blood flow in the presence of pulmonary venous hypertension. That is that aspect of having increase in left atrial pressure and pulmonary venous back pressure it's germane to the development of actual hemorrhage beyond just an increase in pulmonary blood flow. And the next natural question to ask is, well, why would preterm neonates develop increased pulmonary venous pressure in the first place? And certainly, why would it happen in the transitional period when most of the pulmonary hemorrhages occur? And certainly, the answer is in part PDA, of course. And this is data from Ron Kleiman from, uh, again, several decades ago uh, in preterm lambs showing, and these were preterm lambs that uh, had some had a small PDA, some had a moderate PDA, some had a large PDA, but in this uh, lab experiment, they were surgically able to manipulate the PDA to close it and open it at will, 
And what they found was that in all of these preterm lambs, uh, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure was much lower amongst uh, the lambs when their PDAs were closed as to when their PDAs were open. Moreover, as uh, that LV end diastolic pressure was ordinarily related to the size of the ductus arteriosus, again, suggesting that there was a direct causative effect of both having a PDA open as well as the size of the PDA on LV end diastolic pressure. And just to finalize that connection, of course, LV end diastolic pressure in babies who have normal left heart anatomy is the predominant contributor to uh, left atrial uh, hypertension and pulmonary venous pressure. And what about uh, ventricular systolic dysfunction? Because certainly if, there was, if there's LV dysfunction in the transitional period, that by definition would also increase your uh, your end diastolic pressure and result in pulmonary venous hypertension. And there's data that, that is exactly what happens. In the left panel is data from tissue Doppler imaging of the left ventricle during in preterm neonates over the first seven days, where many different, many echoes were done uh, early in the first over 12 hour periods and then over 24 hour periods, and show that there is a drop in LV function as defined by S prime uh, within a year at between 12 to 24 hours, followed by a recovery. And a similar finding happens in the RV. Um, and the similar finding, as you can see in that right panel with uh, TAPSI. So this data suggests that certainly increase in pulmonary blood flow is important, but it must be associated with some type of uh, left heart uh, filling issue. And so with the increase in pulmonary blood flow, there's an increase in pulmonary venous return but something must be wrong with the left ventricle. As we showed, there is a preponderance of LV systolic dysfunction, which results in increased in LA pressure, and that pulmonary venous hypertension leads to hemorrhage. So is there enough evidence here to draw a conclusion regarding the question of are loading conditions and LV function during transition related to disease? So we've seen evidence that, and we know that preterm babies have intrinsic diastolic dysfunction owing to their anatomy and functional immaturity. We know there's a preterm end organ frailty, uh, that they have decreased capillary tensile strength in their germinal matrix and in their lungs. And we know that they also have a PDA shunt, which causes superphysiological pulmonary blood flow, and increased LV end diastolic pressure. But all of these together are a flammable admixture, but the trigger uh, for these events and this morbidity to accrue during their transitional period is some perinatal specific susceptibility likely hypoxia ischemia reperfusion, or the data that I've shown you so far is impaired myocardial performance due to transitional loading conditions. And you know, is there clinical uh, data supporting that? And the answer is yes, there is some. And this is data from a FIFA alpha fascist group associating um, parameters of LV diastolic dysfunction with subsequent onset of pulmonary hemorrhage. And they found that both the LVE prime and the EA prime ratio were both strongly associated with uh, an increase in pulmonary hemorrhage. And uh, this is additional data from uh, a group in Taiwan, which uh, categorized babies according to whether they went on to develop a complication. And those are the babies grouped with the solid triangles versus the babies who did not go on to develop a complication. Um, and they had done echoes every 12 hours. What they identified was that the babies who went on to have to develop a complication had a drop in their LV systolic function uh, in that around that 24 hour mark, as here depicted by the mean velocity of circumferential fiber shortening. And they had also uh, increased indices of LV afterload. And this is in systolic wall stress that was elevated in those babies. Um, and we don't have much time to talk about IVH, but an important paper for any trainee to know about. And this is data from Shahab Nuri from, a, from about 10 years ago, showing that. Uh, the hemodynamic precursors to IVH is probably in its hypoxia ischemia followed by reperfusion injury. Again, very similar to what we see uh, for uh, preterm babies and pulmonary hemorrhage. So as we're wrapping up, what do we do now with this data uh, and with this knowledge that pulmonary hemorrhage and, H and IVH are diseases of disordered transition? Well, many of you thought that the best treatment to prevent pulmonary hemorrhage is NSAID treatment, echo-guided NSAID treatment. And if you did, you're absolutely correct that in a systematic review and meta-analysis, which is still under preparation, but I wanted to present here, that there was an absolute risk reduction of almost over 7% for babies treated 
with an NSAID if they have a, a, a PDA on early echo with a number needed to benefit of 14 to prevent one pulmonary hemorrhage. Compare that to prophylactic indomethacin where the number needed to benefit is 67. But a caution here, and one of the things I want to mention was the big picture that uh, there have been a number of recent early targeted treatment trials using ibuprofen. And when we put them all together, although ibupro targeted ibuprofen treatment reduces pulmonary hemorrhage, there's a finding that it does have an increase in the risk of mortality. Uh, and that risk of mortality is increased by about 3%, with a 95% confidence interval of between 0 and 7%, and a number needed to harm of 33. Uh, so I think caution is warranted to make sure that we're not treating or trying to prevent pulmonary hemorrhage while potentially disadvantaging a baby down the road. And hopefully this comes up in our discussion today. The other big picture in terms of the effect of prophylactic NSAIDs, that prophylactic indomethacin, although the trials are old, probably does result in a moderate reduction in mortality, in addition, of course, to potentially preventing uh, IVH. So how can we actually operationalize this? And the group in Iowa is at the forefront. Um, and we've talked a lot today on you know, using SBC flow or targeted early PDA treatment. And probably there's something in between um, because some babies have PDA, but some babies also have uh, RV dysfunction, excuse me, LV dysfunction or biventricular dysfunction. And we need a way to try and put it all together and not just do, not just perform specific trials, trying to modify one of these specific indices. And although it's not an RCT, there are groups data uh, of instituting early hemodynamic evaluation found that uh, extremely preterm babies had increased survival without severe IVH uh, if they were in the early hemodynamic assessment group. Um, and so what I want to leave you with is that there is a treatment armamentarium to prevent mortality and diseases of disordered transitional physiology in our tiny babies that the first 72 to 96 hours in the lives of our babies, uh, these babies, is like walking this tightrope. Uh, but there are some interventions that are proven, some of them listed here, which um, are things like celestone, delivery in a tertiary center, delayed cord clamping, uh, minimally invasive surfactant, and some postnatal interventions, which we're focused on in this talk, uh, even things like elevating the head of the bed. There's an RCT, it's a question of early hemodynamic assessment, as well as using a NEARS or early echo-targeted PDA treatment, there's still some question marks there. So to wrap up the take-home points here, I hope I've shown you some data that pulmonary hemorrhage and IVH are diseases of disordered transitional circulation and maybe associated with PDA and early LV dysfunction, followed by reperfusion injury. The clinical implications are really twofold. Number one is we should probably try to avoid a, a state of low systemic blood flow in that first 24 hours, as well as avoid an increase in LA pressure. I think we're still not sure how to do that. And secondly, to try and avoid reperfusion um, and the effects of a growing PDA shunt. And for this, there is moderate evidence supportive of PDA prophylaxis uh, in treatment. But while some of these targeted interventions in the transitional period will promise to reduce morbidity, we must be careful to prioritize neonatal outcomes. Certainly IVH is one, but no one would, no one would uh, risk mortality to reduce pulmonary hemorrhage. And uh, I want to show you that the future is upon us, that there are so many factors that need to be looked at in uh, the hemodynamic evaluation and prediction of these early morbidities, that artificial intelligence is the future. And there's one paper so far showing that artificial intelligence using machine learning to comb through all of the thousands of parameters of continuous data, that uh, models, machine learning models, combining cerebral oximetry, prolonged relative desaturations and clinical characteristics have a fairly good accuracy in identifying babies who are gonna go on to have brain injury. So thank you so much for your participation and look very much looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you so much.